I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. My soul will boast to the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Come Christians, join to sing.
God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, 
who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. <coughs> credit for this one. My, I was talking last night with my mom about I was doing children's time today and y'all might know, not know, I'm a really bad procrastinator. And last night I went, oh, I'm doing children's time tomorrow. Oh, I'm really hoping the Lord brings something to me because I don't know what I'm going to do. So my mom decides to tell me of a visual that a pastor at my sister's church did and I fell in love with it and I had to share with all of you. And I'll have my wonderful assistant Jordan helping me today. So we have us, normal milk, and then we have the Holy Spirit. And when we ask Christ into our lives, we get this awesome thing called the Holy Spirit that comes into our lives. But kind of just sits there. And you know, if we... Gotta make sure this is on really tight. Okay. And when we first accept God into our lives, we get the Holy Spirit, we get really excited. We get this fire in our lives, and we get super passionate about everything. And so, it kind of it kind of gets mixed up a little bit, but there's still a lot of white, isn't there? The Holy Spirit hasn't mixed much up in us. And... Uh, Typically, we'll have things come into our lives like a Bible study, or we're really, we're doing really good in reading our Bible every day. And I know at the beginning of the year, those are things that we all are like, we're, I'm going to do so much better this year, I'm going to make sure I'm reading my Bible every morning, I'm going to read the whole thing in a year, or I'm going to start a Bible study group, and we're going to get really on fire, and we're going to do this. Or I know, especially with kids and youth, you might go to camp. And you get this camp high and you get so excited and you get this huge fire in your life and you go out and you're telling everybody about the gospel. Which is kind of what's happened a little bit. You get really excited, but then a couple months down the road, life happens. And maybe there's a week that you just get really busy every morning and you don't have time to read your Bible and you're like, I promise I'll get to it tomorrow. Or you miss Bible study one week and then the next week and then the next week. Or a couple months down the road after camp, school starts back and we all kind of get busy with our lives and it kind of just settles. And you know, the Holy Spirit's always there. He helps you talk with God. But unless we get really fired up, unless we are working on it every single day and we're constantly having this relationship with God, everything kind of settles. But once we get really fired up and we have this relationship with God, all you see is the Holy Spirit. All you see in your life is the Holy Spirit. And all anybody sees is the Holy Spirit. But you have to keep that fire going. You have to keep that passion moving. Otherwise, the Holy Spirit just kind of settles in the bottle. And he's still there. He helps you communicate with God. But he just kind of settles. And lots of people may stop seeing that fire in you. Stop, stop seeing that Holy Spirit in you. So you have to keep moving. You have to keep working. You have to keep growing. You can't let that fire settle. So that way people see only the Holy Spirit in you instead of seeing you. So normally I give you all a weekly challenge, but this is going to take more than a week. So I encourage all of you to uh, really work on it this year, to really 
set, set a daily goal. If, if you're someone who's like me, that has a really hard time of making sure something's happening every day to make sure, say, okay, I'm really going to make sure that this week, I, three days this week, I do this. And then once you get that rhythm down, go, okay, I can do three days a week. That's not a problem. That's easy. Now I'm going to make it four days a week. And you get that down. Now I'm going to make it five days a week. Start small. You don't have to go, I'm going to read my Bible every single morning. I'm going to get up at 5 a.m. and I'm going to be wide awake. Because if you're not someone that normally gets up at 5 a.m., is that going to happen? <laughs> no. You're going to do it a couple of times and then sleep's going to get to you and you go, mm, I like this sleep a lot better. <laughs> so, don't, don't do any big promise to yourself because that's a lot of times where we fail is when we have this big, prob- this big promise to ourselves and then we break that promise once and then we feel like a failure. So make small promises. Say, okay, I haven't been in the Word that great, so I'm going to commit 20 minutes during my lunch break. Or I'm going to commit three days a week. And then once that becomes a habit, it'll be easier to add on maybe 10 more minutes or one more morning or maybe starting a Bible study group and you have some accountability. But you got to keep that fire going. You got to keep that passion going or otherwise we're just going to settle. And nobody really wants to just settle. So y'all will pray with me. Dear God, thank you so much for giving us the Holy Spirit, for giving us something that makes it easier for us to communicate to you, God. But also help us remember to not just let that settle, but to keep that fire stirred up in us and to keep that passion going and to help us remember that it's okay if we fail sometimes, but it's not okay to just let our, let ourselves wallow in that failure, to keep moving and to keep going and to keep thriving and to pick ourselves up from that and to keep going because all we want people to see are you in us. We don't want them to see just us. In your name we pray. Amen. Ashley asked me to make a quick little announcement. Ready Steps is having their book fair again this year. You can either go to the media room that's right down this hallway and look at some in person if you're someone like me who likes to thumb through the books before picking one out. But you can also go to the link which has been provided in the slide and it's all posted throughout the church. And you can look all on the website to order books and 25% of the proceeds comes back to the program which then they're able to buy new equipment for classrooms, new toys, new teaching material, all of that. Uh, But they are having a pre-sale today after service. So if anybody would like to go look at the books, Ashley will be in there after service today. Thank you all. For those who may not be aware, Ashley is our Mother's Day Out director and uh, also takes care of our nursery on Sunday. And so uh, we're uh, excited about this book fair. The, uh, as we were singing that song about the presence of the Holy Spirit and then of course this wonderful illustration, um, did you notice how vigorously Jordan shook that up? <laughs> Just a hint. <laughs> the, uh, uh, I was surprised he didn't turn it upside down, you know, because uh, you could stand on your head maybe. Uh, somebody was telling me about that today. But um, uh, a wise person told me, even twice today already, um, the uh, don't feel sorry, do better next time. Okay? Don't spend four days in the mully grubs beating yourself up when you get off track. Jesus will forgive you right away. You don't have to take four days for that to happen if you ask him. And then just do better. Because the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, if that spirit dwells in you, you also will be quickened. Amen. I don't know if you saw the beautiful floral arrangement here is in loving memory of Becky uh, Harrison. And so we just remember the Harrison family today as we pray. Father, we thank you 
that in times of stress, in times of grief and loss, in times of sickness, in times of joy and gladness, that you wrap your arms of love around us and encourage our hearts and hold us close in those days. And so, Father, we just rejoice in Jesus Christ, our Savior, as our sister, as her spirit is in your presence, and one day uh, the grave will be empty. And so, Father, we rejoice in Jesus Christ, our Lord, and give you thanks and praise that you sent him into this world to die our death and to live again, that we too could have a new life in Christ. And so, Father, empower us by your Holy Spirit to live that life joyfully. And so, Lord, we give you thanks and praise for the power you give us to live the life you have called us to. Father, we thank you that we live in this nation where we can gather like this and and no one's trying to rip the cross off the top of our building and uh, tell us that we can't worship. And so, Lord, we lift up our nation to you and ask for your blessing. Father, we pray for uh, those who we have elected to serve us. We pray for President Biden and Vice President Harris and the Cabinet and the House and the Senate and uh, the Supreme Court and uh, our governor and lieutenant governor and legislature and courts and our county and city governments. And we lift these elected officials up who are your servants, Father. And we ask, Father, that your spirit direct their hearts. And we give you thanks and praise, Lord, for all that you're doing in our midst to help us turn towards you, to continue to follow after you, to lift people up in prayer, to, to love one another. And so, Father, we thank you and give you praise. We lift up the folks who work in our government. We lift up our first responders, especially, Lord, in this time of pandemic, Father. And Lord, we thank you and we give you praise that you are present with them and that you are helping them, that you are encouraging them, and that, Lord, the long hours and the, just the busyness of, of so much sickness, Father, that, Lord, you are present to help them in all those things. And for that, we give you thanks and praise. Father, we pray for one another in our need and in our joy and in our sorrows. We lift each other up and encourage one another in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. And, Father, for all these things, we, we, we give you praise and thanks. You alone are God, and so, Father, we come to you in worship and praise, giving thanks, as Jesus taught us when he said, pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So we continue to worship the Lord uh, in uh, song. But at this time of... Uh, just dedicating ourselves and our gifts to Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father, thank you that you've given us everything that we have. Yes, Lord, we have worked hard to get there, but it is from your hand. And so we give you thanks, Father, and we give a tithe and an offering, Lord, to honor you. And so, Father, I thank you for your, your people who have been so faithful, and I bless them. I bless you, 
In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. of God All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend I have lived in the goodness of God You know, I always, um, uh, uh, I'm going to do a little demonstration here. The, uh, 
So I had to get down here because I, I didn't know if I could run down the steps. But anyway, uh, that song reminded me of, of the prodigal son. Remember that story? Where he goes off and blows all his wealth and uh, becomes a, really a, a homeless person, destitute and lost. And then the Holy Spirit breathes something into his life and he realizes that in my father's house even the servants have food to eat. And so he says he'll return and ask for forgiveness and don't call me a son, call me a servant, a slave. And uh, so he heads back. And it says, the father saw him a long way off. Now you got to know that the father had been looking for him for a long time. And when he saw him a long way off, Jesus said he picked up his skirts and ran <laughs> and embraced him and put sandals on his feet because he didn't even have shoes and a ring on his finger and a robe around him. That's what the Father does for us. He saw us a long way off, and some of us are still a long way off. But the Father runs to us to help us out. Amen. I turn off my mic, I gotta blow my nose. <laughs> I tell you, I just love it when the Holy Spirit has a plan and tells all of us so that we can work together. The music is beautiful today. Thank you so much. Uh, just in case you didn't know, it's okay to be emotional in church. Um, you know, um, Psalm 103 reminds us, Bless the Lord with all that is within me. And, and it moves us to join from there with all creation to express our love for God to him in heartfelt worship. Because of his steadfast love for us, his faithfulness in loving us, and the all-encompassing forgiveness that he extends to everyone. And yes, God does extend that to everyone, and each one of us is responsible to make a decision about what will we do with this Jesus Christ. I'm excited that the psalmist didn't know but saw and then wrote this psalm. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. 
The Lord ex- executeth righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. He made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. And like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust, and as for man, his days are as great. Grass as a flower of the field, so he flourisheth. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and the place thereof shall know it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him, and his righteousness unto children's children, to such as keep his covenant, and to those that remember his commandments to do them. The Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom ruleth over all. Bless the Lord, ye his angels that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all ye his hosts, ye ministers of his, that do his pleasure. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. The word of God for the people of God. Please pray with me and for me. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. When I finished last week, I was talking about uh, those who fear him. And that is the key for right understanding of of God's all-encompassing love. And he repeats this phrase three times, those who fear him. The fear of the Lord grounds our human knowledge and wisdom in humble service to God. And those who know your name will trust in you. For you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. You see the phrase, this idea of fear of the Lord has its experience or its, its presence in God's divine majesty. And it eventually has come to express the total claim of God upon every life, your life, my life. And the total response of humans to God. We love him because he first loved us. We're to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul and with all our mind and with all our strength. Are you running after those things? Are you running to get the prize? Running to win a crown that will last forever? Don't run aimlessly. Don't fight like a man beating the air. No, beat your body and make it your slave so that after you have proclaimed the gospel to others, you will not be disqualified for the prize. Paul's advice to the Corinthians about running a race. Effectively, those who fear the Lord are are those who have decided to put God first in their lives. You can pat yourself on the back if you've made that decision. It's okay. It's a good decision. It's the right decision. But the focus, you see, is on our need for forgiveness. And the idea of those who fear the Lord uh, refers to those who genuinely seek to live their lives for God in a holistic manner. 
It's about a fully uh, devoted follower of Jesus Christ, about integrated life of faith reflecting a genuine desire to apply love for God and biblical truth to every area of our life. And those who fear the Lord are those who honestly desire to live for God. I guess I have to admit that some days I'm not there. But God is faithful. The the reason for the all-encompassing forgiveness extended to those who fear God is the great love and mercy and compassion that God has. That's who he is. God is love, and it is grounded in in the act of divine remembrance, for he knows how we are formed. And everyone goes to about being knit together in your mother's womb, and that's true. God knew about that before you were even conceived. God knew you. But here's what other things God knows. God knows every inclination of our heart is evil from childhood. Genesis 8:21. God knows we are tempted when by our own evil desires we are dragged away and enticed. And then after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. The evil deeds of a wicked man ensnare him. The cords of his sin hold him fast. He will die for lack of discipline. Led astray by his own great folly. He knows how we're formed. So Jesus knew all men and he didn't put his trust in them. But there is hope. You know, this speaks to us of our human weakness, the fallibility and the brevity of life. And and God remembers our finite nature and is therefore all the more willing to extend his grace to us because he knows how we are formed. Look, God demonstrated his love for you and for me in this. While we were still enemies... Christ died for us. And since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through him, through whom we have now received reconciliation. And therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting our sins against us. And God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in Jesus Christ we might become the righteousness of God. Remembrance is important. We are to remind our own soul to forget not all these benefits, including the awareness of God remembers the essence of our human existence, even though it is as fleeting as grass whose place remembers it no more. And since God remembers those who fear him, we should remember to keep his covenant and obey his commands. Remembering is key. Mindful of God's great grace will Being mindful of God's great grace will shape our life, our worship of and response to him. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is on those who fear him. The psalmist picks up once again on the blessing of the covenant relationship. It's, It's the new covenant. 
the new testament, the new covenant, the new will. God's eternal love is on those who fear him. His righteousness extends from generation to generation as the same constant relationship with God is handed down from father to son, from mother to daughter, and made personal to the next generation. Each one of us must make a commitment to Jesus Christ in faith. Grace is unmerited. You can't do anything to get it. You just receive it. It calls forth a response in our heart and life. God remembers we are formed from the dust, so we're weak. His grace extends to those who fear him. That is, to those whose heartfelt desire is to honor him. And with this truth in mind, what is our response to God? We cannot remain unmoved by such love. Love should always be met with a response in kind. There's a a beautiful simplicity in the psalmist's conclusion to love God is to keep covenant with him and to remember to obey, literally to do his commands. And Jesus said, look, a new command I'm giving you. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. We respond to his grace by commitment to love him. Through mindfulness of his commands. His commands are not grievous. You know, in our day, love and mercy are looked on kind of weak. Oh, that's a weak person. Look at that. The same was true among the ancients. God's compassion is not a sign of his inability, but an expression of mercifulness. But the Lord said to Moses, Don't limit my power. My arm is not too short. You will see I can do what I say I can do. And that uh, comes from uh, the story of uh, the quail. People weren't happy with the menu at the church cafeteria. This manna drives us nuts. We want some real food. And God says, okay, Moses, tell them they're going to eat meat for a month. And Moses is like, if we caught every fish in the sea, we wouldn't have enough meat to feed 600,000 men plus women and children. Remember that discussion? Well, you're going to read about it here this month. Anyway, he, uh, he says, look, I can do what I say I can do. I'm faithful. You see, God has established his throne in heaven and he does not need to assert his authority through a display of power. And the un, as the undisputed king of the universe, he's able to extend mercy to his people. You've got to remember that this psalm was written after they had come back from the Babylonian captivity. Okay? And so put that in mind. And so because they weren't following after him, he stirred up the Babylonians. Who was that king? Nebuchadnezzar. You were supposed to tell me. I couldn't remember. Um, And he came and conquered them. But then his kingdom was conquered. And without lifting the sword, he spoke into the heart of the king and said, send them back to Jerusalem so they can rebuild the city and my temple. 
You see, God asserted his authority by delivering his people over to exile and by bringing them home from captivity once again. God's rule is firmly established. He is king over a kingdom, and the kingdom image implies an authority affecting every conceivable area of life. God's kingdom is a reality. And when the king speaks into every area of life and the proper covenantal response is what? To apply his standard of love to every aspect of our lives and the world around us. I mean, isn't this really what we declare when we say, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven? We declare that God is king of the universe. The salvation of the Lord is the manifestation of the reign of the Lord in the world. You're being saved. That change that you know took place in your heart and life is the sign that God is ruling That his spirit is bearing witness with your spirit that you are a son or daughter of God. And the grace of the Lord is a sovereignty of grace. The initial call to bless God is addressed to, to his angels who are then described as the mighty ones who do his bidding and heavenly hosts and his servants and this call to worship addressed to the angelic armies of the Lord is is, uh, the consequence of his cosmic reign. The idea of doing God's word lies at the very core of angelic existence. They are there to be his servants to do what he says. And the angels do his word in order to heed the sound of his word. And that gives us an example for humans who desire is to worship God with our lives. Which is our spiritual act of worship. And there should be uh, and is a joyous praise in heaven among the doers of the kingdom uh, of the Lord. That there are doers on earth who confirm the love of the Lord by their obedience. I tell you, there is rejoicing in heaven in the presence of the angels of God over one who repents. And God's will is that no one should be lost and all should come to the knowledge of faith. The psalmist moves from charging all the angelic hosts with their responsibility to praise. Look, John tells us, I I looked and heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000 and they encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders and in a loud voice they sang, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise and then calling the whole created order to raise its voice in blessing God. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. And the four living creatures said amen and the elders fell down and worshiped. You see, this initial uh, praise the Lord, O my soul, of verse 1 has has a personal, individualistic ring to it. But it goes on further than that. In in the final remainder, to praise the Lord, O my soul, the psalmist puts his voice with the whole host of creation in praising God and lifting up the Creator. All creation sings out the praise and we raise our voices along with the heavenly armies and all those on earth who fear the Lord and this communion of praise is cosmic. And then the voice came from the throne saying, 
Praise our God, all his servants, you who fear him, both small and great. And then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing water and like loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah! For the Lord God Almighty reigns and let us rejoice and be glad and give him victory. And the call for all the works of the Lord to praise him is addressed to everywhere in his domain. Praise due to the king. The picture is of a, a grateful subject paying homage to their ruler for all his good works that bring them benefit. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Amen. I'm excited, I don't know about y'all. But, you know, like I said, everyone needs to make a commitment to Jesus Christ. And so, if you haven't made that commitment, you can now. Just talk to him. The altars, of course, are open if you want to come down and pray. Uh, we're going to be led in some music that, in rejoicing and worshiping God. Um, those of us who have been saved forever... Uh, there's a few points God wants to bring out in your life. So it won't hurt any of us to make a trip down to the altar maybe. Bow our heads and repent a little bit. Tell God with your help. I can do all things that strengthen me. We all have something that we're working on. And folks, today is the day of salvation. And so, let's not put it off. Let's sing.
of our Lord Jesus Christ and the communion and power of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen.